Yeah. All right, friends. Uh, we're having our last uh, presentation for the afternoon. Uh, I've had some great ones so far. Everybody having a good time? Yeah. All right. Well, next up is uh, Jason Liu. Uh, it is talk, The Angelic Reformation, John D. Pinocchio Magic and the Occult Roots of Empire. Jason Liu has been publicly involved in magic and esotericism for nearly two decades, with a focus on Western esoteric tradition, Sufism, Tantric Hinduism, and Buddhism, Nepali shamanism, and many more. He is a working journalist and author whose many books have been, had a major impact on the growing interest in magic and mass culture, including Generation X, Ultra Culture Journal, the Psychic Bible, which he put together with Genesis Prior Peorge. He also teaches at magic.me, his online portal to learning the structured theory and practice of chaos magic. Counterculture, publishing legend, are you serious, calls Jason, quote, one of humanity's best mutant scouts on the frontiers of human experience. Over the last several years, he's been immersed in the study of John D. and Nokian Magic, which he will be presenting now. Thank you. Uh, can, you, can you hear me? Can everyone hear me? Okay, good. All right, cool. So um, it's wonderful to be here. Thank you for having me here, and thank you for spending your Saturday with me. Uh, since this is the last uh, uh, presentation of the afternoon, uh, I have a feeling, as entertaining as I am, some of you may be flagging. So I want you all to stand up, please. And I know we're all super serious, many of you are cold and here. Uh, now let's just like shake out for half a second. Like this. Yeah. Wake up. Uh, okay, and put your hands up in the air, and uh, I would probably have you do this through your nose, but that could get messy, so if you're out, do this. And grab with your hands like this. <laughs> All right, let's talk about Elizabethan history. Yeah. Are you excited? Yeah. Okay, so uh, so my presentation is about John Dee, who I know I'm sure all of you are familiar with. Uh, he is the originator of what is commonly known, but what he did not call the Nokia Network, which itself is really the undercurrent of the entire Western esoteric tradition. Um, he is known uh, as He's kind of remembered as this strange guy, but um, I, about two, I've been in obsessed with for 10 years, but particularly about two years ago, I started working on, on a, I worked on a short, an article and a short ebook about me, and the John Dee that I discovered uh, is the, the, the intellect of this man, and the influence of him, not just in magic, but in all fields, is, is astounding. Um, I, I can't really think of that many more people did because that has as deep of an effect on the history of not just Western magic, but the world we live in and the history of the world and have been completely ignored and buried. Obviously because he was in, into, into magic, so he was uh, sidelined for centuries. Um, what I found is that uh, there are lots of, there have been lots of historical and scientific studies of Dean and none of them will touch magic with a 10 foot pole. So that side of him has been ignored and written out of history. We've got that on one side, and then on the other side we have uh, occult books about D and his angelic system. Um, those, uh, which are, many of them are excellent books, only focus on one aspect of, of D, so they leave out the context that that work occurred in. Uh, so what I would like to do today is uh, share with you the big picture, and the, there's no possible way I can cover every single detail of this. Um, it's massive, so I'm, I'm, I may rush in a few places, but bear with me. Um, there is a book coming out from Inner Traditions um, next year. Uh, it will be called The Angelic Reformation, or possibly something else. Um, and that is almost done, and it will be it contain all the details, so, so stay tuned for that. <coughs> okay. John D. Uh, uh, he, so this individual, uh, born in Mortlake in, in England, uh, which is a suburb southwest of London, at the beginning of the 16th century, uh, he uh, is not a man of means at the beginning, he's born to a family where his, his father is a, uh, like a sower, a gentleman sower to the, uh, to the court, to the king. 
uh, but he is brilliant. He's a child prodigy. He is raised. Uh, he's you know is able to do this complex mathematics in his head at an early age. He's learning Latin and Greek at an early age. There's uh, really only one other person of this period who has that type of intellect, and that's Queen Elizabeth herself, who's also an incredible mind. Um, but he is raised. He go. He's educated by the uh, Catholics uh, at an early age and becomes immersed in. Catholic ritual and ritual timings and, and planetary timings and the mathematics of ritual. So at a very early age, his mind is forming in this, this matrix of, uh, of the intersection of mathematics and, and essentially ceremonial magic, right, or religious ritual. Now, as we get further into this, I want you to, and when we start to talk about magic, I want you to leave to one side any preconceptions from uh, Golden Dawn, or Thelema, or Chaos Magic, or everything that we think about, uh, or even uh, the more magic, um, leave that to one side because it's only going to unnecessarily confuse, uh, confuse us as we go into this topic. Um, even though there are magical aspects to think, it's much better to uh, approach him from the angle of religion and to look at it as, you know, as time goes on as more of like um, uh, an Elijah or an Enoch from the Bible as, as, as somebody who's receiving wisdom in a religious sense. So, so anything you've learned about Enochian from Golden Dawn or Crowley or any of this, leave it, leave it to the side at least for the next hour and then we'll get back into it. So he, uh, now, <laughs> was me doing my best is having the eighth impression. <laughs> um, uh, so but the time that Dee is born into is critical. He is born into the uh, the only short, you know, he's, he's born basically around the time the Reformation begins. Martin Luther has nailed his 95 theses to the door of the church in Wittenberg. Uh, this is an apocalyptic moment in European history. I don't think that as modern people we have any kind of context for the, 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 the not only the ontological, but the eschatological terror that people felt during the Reformation. Uh, the Catholic Church uh, which then was just the church, had essentially controlled all of Europe for over a thousand, you know, since the, uh, the conversion of Rome. Uh, and there was one truth. The idea of religion that we have now as it essentially being like a, a shopping mall where you can go and try different identities and try different religions and look at the world from different aspects, that does, that does not exist, right? It's the Catholic Church, period, the end. And uh, Luther's uh, rebellion is seen by some as a liberation, but by most as essentially apocalyptic. Right? This, there's only one uh, thing this can be an indicator of, and that's that the world is coming to an end. That people are rebelling against the church and setting up what is essentially seen as a satanic rebellion against Rome. Uh, there's only what you know that is essentially must be a, a, a symbol of the end times. All the antichrist must be coming. And in the last speech, uh, uh, Durer, Albrecht Durer, was mentioned. Uh, uh, I'm sure many have seen his woodcuts, these apocalyptic uh, engravings of angels uh, combating the red dragon or Satan in the skies. Uh, these are these are in every home in in England, and uh, this forms people's <laughs> outlook on the world. Uh, so, uh, what that means is uh, people are a little high strung. They think that uh, everything could be coming to an end at any given at any given moment, and that is what uh, uh, forms people's underlying view of reality. And obviously, Henry VIII uh, kicks this off by uh, the founding the Anglican Church, uh, throwing out uh, Rome and sacking the uh, throwing the priests out of Rome and privatizing the churches in England, and essentially declaring himself the head of the Anglican Church. What we have to remember, though, is the Anglican Church is in theory Protestant, but really it's just a clone, it's like a, a GitHub clone of, uh, of uh, the Catholic Church, but it's with Henry at the top instead of uh, the Pope, but that's really the only difference. The ritual is all the same, the timing is all the same, uh, the theology is all the same. Then you have little uh, splinter groups who are like uh, um, Calvinists or uh, Anabaptists, uh, uh, Methodists, Presbyterians. Those are seen as the heretics of the heretics. Right, they're like us now, right? They're, uh, uh, they are the, 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 you know, on the total fringes of society. So, um, and, and still persecuted. Uh, now, the other thing that uh, forms, I'm sure some of you, and I apologize if the slide is cut off, but I saw you, I'm sure some of you have come across this concept before, the great chain of being. 
Uh, this is essentially the, 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 the scientific outlook, if you will, of the pre-scientific world instead of our current, uh, um, you know. <clears throat> Can you hear me if I talk from here, by the way? Can you hear me? Okay, cool. <laughs> okay, good. Um, so essentially the world is seen as a giant hierarchy, and we inherit this and we uh, take this on as people who are interested in the occult or the esoteric now, because this is essentially the, this will make sense for us much more than it will for the average person on the street, because this is the view of reality that in, under, uh, uh, informs essentially Kabbalistic magic or, or, or more magic, where we get these long tables of correspondences and, and sephiroth and all of that. Basically, God is at the top, top of the hierarchy of existence. We've got beneath him are angels. Beneath the angels is man, animals, plants, minerals. It's obviously much more complex than this, but essentially everything in the universe is seen as a interlocking hierarchy. It's like uh, uh, when Crowley talks about the vision of the machinery of the universe as attributed to Yassad in, in 777. That's essentially what you know. One thing you know. One thing he's talking about. This is the Neoplatonic view of of. Uh, the universe, and um, so without any two, this gets much more fast. There's many more sub layers of this, but we'll skip that for now. Um, now, all of these things are considered to be sublunary. We probably heard the phrase sub the sublunary world. The sub uh, to be sublunary, which literally means to be in Malkuth or or the sphere of Earth beneath the moon, is to be fallen. If you're beneath the layer of the moon, you are if you are fallen. You're subjected to the the um, the condition of the fall of man. Right, we're uh, we, we're left. We've left the Garden of Eden. Everything in the universe is corrupt. Why is it corrupt? It's corrupted by original sin. It's corrupted by the ongoing sins of mankind and even of animals. Uh, uh, and even even angels are subject to to sin. Uh, sin uh, essentially. Okay, so so if the world is a perfectly ordered system, why does everything fuck up all the time? Why is there why is there madness and tragedy and horror and all of this? The answer is sin. Uh, people cause this stuff by, by their own sin, which is essentially uh, causes chaos or friction within the system. The system is perfect, but our own uh, uh, sinful actions essentially create chaos within it. So, um, so we're going to get into Christian territory here. You're going to have to you're going to have to live in the Christian uh, worldview for the next uh, <laughs> uh, hour because that's the worldview that you lived in. Um, so uh, mankind is is in a particularly precarious position. Because mankind can commit, uh, uh, mankind has free will and can commit carnal sins, uh, physical sins, which are the, the, the domain of animals, and he can also uh, 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 commit sins of the intellect or the spirit. Angels can only commit sins of the intellect and spirit, much like fallen angels, but they can't commit carnal sins because they don't have bodies, right? So man is in this bizarre intermediary, intermediary position. If you study Tibetan Buddhism, uh, it is very similar to the position of of human beings in the uh, Baba Kantra, or the, the sixth chamber wheel of life. Uh, so, uh, uh, so man will reach. Man must reach up to the angels, who themselves are subject to sin. But in order, uh, angels are the intermediaries between gods and man. So, and man uh, is constantly striving to uh, communicate with the angels, to be like the angels, to emulate the angels, and to resist his lower carnal nature. Right, while while also striving not to commit theological. You know, the sins of mind. So what that means practically is uh, people are talking to angels a lot. You know, there's a lot of angelic angelic magic and scrying, which is the uh, as I'm sure you people know, is the art of uh, seeing spirits in a crystal ball. <clears throat> Very widespread at this time. Scryers, it's not just Dean Kelly. Scryer is essentially a profession. Uh, that is uh, very prominent yet not, you know, socially approved. It's kind of like, a, like a TV psychics or phone psychics now. They're everywhere. <laughs> Lots of people use them. They're still considered, you know, at the bottom of society. Uh, so basically the same, right? Um, and so this is what people are trying to do. They're trying to communicate with angels and reconcile themselves with God, uh, knowing that the world and the end of the world is not. Uh, that's an intense, that's a, that's a heavy trip, man. <laughs> right? Okay. So, uh, this is Dee's worldview before my Catholicism. At an early age, he goes to the University of Louvain, uh, spelled the same as my last name, in, uh, uh, in, in, in uh, uh, Holland, right, in the Low Countries. And he basically, he had studied in 
the UK, but science and math, which were his focus, were not, they were, you know, people were much more interested in humanism, so like the liberal arts and a liberal education and literature and, and uh, humanism, which was essentially the study of the Greek classics. That's what people were interested in. They were not interested in science. So he fled to Holland, to the University of Louvain, it's a Catholic university, it's still there, where he began to study everything. Now you have to remember, this is the last time in, in, in Western history where it's still possible to know everything. And by that, <laughs> literally, and by that I mean to have read essentially all published uh, uh, information or, or, or information that was available at that time that had not been destroyed in the burning of the Library of Alexandria or had not been destroyed at, during the sack of Constantinople. So that's what he does. So you see him essentially studying every single branch of knowledge, focusing on uh, uh, geography. He studies under uh, Mercator, uh, who we now know is the creator of the Mercator projection, which is the, the world map that we all use. Uh, he is, so he's studying geography, mathematics, astrology, astronomy, uh, 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 Latin, Greek, Hebrew, French, and then, as time goes on, he becomes interested in the Kabbalah and uh, alchemy and hermeticism. Now, at the time, there's a lot of really intense ideas going around Europe. One of them is uh, introduced to him by his mentor, uh, uh, Yolande Postel, who, uh, which is the idea that there is an Ur language, uh, that there is a language underlying all languages, it was spoken by mankind at the beginning of, uh, but prior to the fall of the Tower of Babel, right? That all languages are a reflection of. Dee becomes obsessed with this idea, um, and uh, in addition to this, the idea of a new, what we would now call a new world order. The idea that there should be uh, no nation states, that there should be no, uh, essentially globalization, we're talking about globalization at this time, it's the beginning of the 16th century that there should not be nation states, that intellectuals, at least intellectuals, the intellectual elite should be able to communicate across nation state boundaries. <clears throat> and uh, um, the, what they call at the time global citizens, which is a phrase we still hear today, right, or citizens of the world. Uh, so these, these ideas become too obsessed deep. Um, around, he comes back, uh, okay, so around this time, he is, Becoming influenced by essentially, you know, these ideas that are only uh, given to the Illuminati, right? To, to you, not specifically to use that phrase, but as a way of speaking. So he's thinking about not only these ideas, but at this time, the idea like the heliocentric model, the Copernican model, the idea that uh, the sun is at the center of the solar system, this is for the elite. Um, basic mathematics, this is for the elite. This is considered to be the dark arts, right? Uh, literally. And uh, uh, average people are terrified, as terrified of mathematics as they are of sorcery, right? So D um, uh, becomes a lecturer in mathematics on the continent. He goes, uh, he, he is, I believe, in France and lectures on the foundational principles of Euclid. He is, I believe, the first person to give to the public the ideas of the plus minus uh, multiplication and, and divide signs, right? This is the amount of knowledge people had at the time. His lectures are so popular that people are climbing through the windows to see them. It's the most popular lectures that have ever been had on the continent. He is a rock star at the age of, I think, 24. Right? He's extremely he's the, the most in-demand lecturer uh, by people who are starved for knowledge that are just starting to come out of the dark ages, right? In a real way. So um, he is given offers by the, all the kings of Europe, including that he's given an offer to teach at the, uh, um, uh, to be the court mathematician in France. He is a patriot to the end. He turns down all these offers, which would have been incredibly well paid and prestigious to come back to England because he's a patriot and he believes in his country. Uh, as soon as he comes back, they throw him in uh, the Tower of London and torture him for, um, uh, uh, he's accused of, of calculating which means to draw up an, an astrological chart. Uh, he, at this time, uh, Mary is the queen of um, is the queen of uh, England. So there's, this is during the, the Catholic uh, Reclamation of England. Uh, after Henry VIII, his daughter uh, Cap, uh, uh, Mary, who is a Catholic, is taking control. They are burning Protestants uh, in, at the stake uh, on moss in the in the public streets, the smell of burning fat is impossible to escape, it's everywhere, it's, it's hideous, right? And so Dee uh, draws up a chart of Mary, 
for Elizabeth. Um, that he is accused of, count of, of conspiring with Elizabeth to overthrow the Queen, uh, thrown in the, done in the Tower of London, tortured, let out, given to a guy named Bishop Bonner, who is a, 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 a high-ranking Catholic. He becomes uh, essentially reconverts to Catholicism after becoming interested in, in Protestant ideas and, uh, on the continent. It's basically like coming back. This is like you, you have to imagine it's like coming back to living in Georgia after being in, in New York or something like that. <laughs> so, uh, England is very behind. But we'll catch up thanks to you shortly. So uh, he uh, basically has to recant and uh, be re educated and, and, and take on new Catholic loyalties. Um, and he, uh, but during this time, he's starting to reassemble all the knowledge that he has learned uh, on the continent. He writes a book called The Prophet Dumata Aphoristica, which is a fascinating book. It's a little hard to get, but you can still find it. Um, where his theory, this is his, he begins to establish his theory of magic. And to me, it's fascinating. It is not like, it is not like anything we recognize as a cult theory today. Here, these days, we talk about uh, the magic as a lifestyle. We talk about it as, you know, you'll hear people talking about tapping into the powers of the unconscious, or we see it as a, like a psychologized thing, you know, like post-Regardi, post, you know, post-Crowley. I think this tendency really starts with uh, Crowley's introduction to the Goetia, actually, where he says, I'm sure some of you are familiar with where he says, the spirits of the Goetia are portions of the human brain. Uh, none of that exists indeed. He's talking about science, right? His theory uh, of magic is essentially that it, is, it exists in light. It's, it's a quality of, it, and he doesn't talk about magic, but he talks about qualities of light. And he's drawing on an earlier philosopher named Al-Kindi, who's a, a, an Arabic philosopher or, or a Muslim philosopher, uh, and some other people, Roger, uh, uh, Roger Bacon and Gross Test. So he, this is what he says. He basically says, to, to, to sim oversimplify this, he basically says that there are emanations coming off everything. That there are emanations coming off the stars, the planets, the sun, um, and they're constantly affecting us, which is basically what astrology says, right? It's saying that the stars, the planets are, are uh, subtly affecting us, right? But he takes this to say it's actually, that's literally the light waves are hitting us and interacting with our, uh, the psychological makeup, right? Or our, our physical makeup and literally it's starting to change us. Um, <clears throat> And, uh, but not just the stars, but everything. So essentially, he's basically saying there's vibes coming out of everything, man. And uh, <laughs> not only can we, and that's the, how the machinery of the universe works. Um, but he takes it further, and he says, but if that's the case, then can we harness those emanations? Can we, for instance, set up a scrying ball to observe them? Can we set up a focusing magnifying glass to focus and hit the hit the light of let's say let's uh, say the let's say, let's say you want to make a, a well talisman, maybe set up a, a, a lens, capture the light from Jupiter and focus it like a magnifying glass ray onto a Jupiter talisman you're making. Interesting idea, right? Right. Nobody's picked up on this ever. So <clears throat> that's the uh, Propdumata aphoristica. Obviously, he is obsessed with optics as well. He creates something called the paradoxical compass, which is uh, later critical to England's naval success. Um, and so he's uh, really looking at, um, uh, he's, he's interdisciplinary. And this is one of the reasons why he has not been properly written about, is because he, it's in order to understand it, you have to understand everything, essentially. Right? So he's, he's, he's looking at the intersections of astrology, optics, mathematics, and sorcery. Um, Queen Elizabeth comes to power. Uh, the one of the greatest monarchs that England has ever had, uh, and is responsible for bringing England out of the Dark Ages and into, uh, from a, a bankrupt island nation into the greatest empire the world has ever seen. Um, she takes power. When she takes power, he ascends with her. He becomes her scientific and astrological advisor, although they do not pay him very well, uh, which he's very upset about. Um, it's often thought that, uh, you know, it's easy to, when you get into D, see him as some type of mastermind of the British Empire, but in fact he was essentially an underpaid government consultant and was constantly out of work. Uh, but he uh, gets this role, um, let's see, man, I really, okay, I'm going to have to speed up because we're, I gotta, there's so much to cover here. I apologize if I can't get through all of this, it's just, if you're going to have to wait for the book. But, um, <laughs> His, the, the amount of detail in, in, in this man's life is astounding. So, uh, okay, so 
he, they don't pay him. He's really pissed, even though he's been so loyal to them. Remember, he's come back from Europe uh, and been tortured. Uh, but now they don't trust him because he had to re recant and be re-educated into Catholicism. So now they say, well, now you're a Catholic, so how can we trust you now? So he's, he's just screwed, right? So, all right, so what does he do? He goes on a secret mission for Sir Francis uh, Walsingham, who was the head of the English uh, Secret Service at this time, which, which we now know as MI5 and MI6. Uh, it's just getting started. Elizabethan Intelligence Services is still studied today by the CIA and NSA as, a, as an early model of intelligence services. They've studied it quite a bit as well. Um, so he goes to back to the Netherlands to look for a book called the Steganographia, Steganographia uh, by Trithemius, which I'm sure some of you know as well. This is um, essentially the pro, you know, the real. A source text of a lot of Western ceremonial magic. It is an early uh, grimoire. This book was copied by um, into uh, uh, Agrippa, Cornelius Agrippa, was Trithemius' student. Uh, Agrippa got all the, all the tables of correspondences and, and, and a lot of also Galatia and angels and, and, and all that stuff was in here first. Um, it was then put into Agrippa's three books of occult philosophy. And from there it goes into Francis Barrett's The Mag uh, Magus, and from there it goes into the Golden Dawn Agrippa. So, but uh, Trithemius, who we see here, was a Catholic priest who was really into conjuring spirits. The book purported to uh, allow people to communicate at a distance, where you wrote on a piece of paper the message you wanted to communicate. It was, uh, and you focused on it, and then somebody in another country uh, did the same ritual at the same time and was given the message that way. And it has a, a whole roster of spirits to conjure, much like the Goetia. This was of such interest to English uh, um, uh, intelligence that they sent him and paid his way to get this. This was essentially like a, a technological arms race to get this book and to find it and to search the, uh, high and low these libraries, because as you can imagine, this, this work would be of interest for <clears throat> uh, um, spying. It was also an early code book of cryptography. As you can see, uh, it, you can move things around, and uh, there's a whole system of cryptography. It was only solved in the 1990s by a guy named Jim Reeds at Bell Labs. He, um, and as soon as they solved it as cryptography, they said, well, it's not really a magic book. It's a book on cryptography. Forget all the occult stuff. Uh, as we know, cryptography and magic can coexist. The world is not black and white. And it has been speculated that it's actually a book on magic dis disguised as a book on cryptography, disguised as a book on magic. <laughs> right, so the whole occult layer underneath that is cryptography. When you break through cryptography, you find the real occult stuff. Why would this be plausible deniability? It's because if, they, if the church found, found it, you could say, sorry, it's a book on cryptography. And uh, if his enemies found it, he could say, sorry, it's a book on magic. <laughs> All right. Um, D goes on from this to uh, uh, write a book called the uh, Hieroglyphic Monad, which I'm telling you you've probably seen. Uh, uh, he, this is a synthesis of all hermetic knowledge, and um, he, this is actually a picture. This is I took this event, he exhibit in London. So this is the actual a printing of the actual book. If you look at this image, um, he essentially takes this one image. And he says, this is the key of the mysteries. This has everything in it. Uh, you can, it's a little hard to do, but it contains every single planetary uh, symbol and one symbol. So you've got the sun, the moon, the, uh, you can fit, if you turn it upside down, you can get the Saturn and, and uh, Jupiterian signs from it. You can get Venus, Mercury, everything's in there. Um, and he goes on to say, this is the key to understanding all of nature. So, <laughs> However, he is frustrated because he's now he's now so angry in England that he goes to um, he goes to uh, uh, he tries to go back and get patronage uh, with Maximilian, the Holy Roman Emperor, by presenting him with this mo uh, the hieroglyphic monad. All the emperors of Europe at this time, all the all the sovereigns of Europe at this time, <coughs> are obsessed with alchemy. It's like the uh, it's like the arms race or the tech race of its day because whoever solves the, uh, whoever figures out alchemy first gets infinite money, right? So obviously they're interested in that. 
but uh, they're not really interested in natural philosophy, which is essentially a cult philosophy, uh, or the idea of wisdom, gaining wisdom, they can care less about that. So D uh, presents uh, Maximilian with this book and says, hey, this has all the secrets of the universe in it. Maximilian says, can it make me infinite money? And D says, no, but it can make you wise. Maximilian says, GT GTFO. <laughs> So, um, yeah, around the same time he writes the preface to the elements of Euclid, where he outlines more of his ideas. We'll skip over this one. Uh, you can see Hermes is engraved, engraved in there. This is uh, also a picture, this is uh, Dee's uh, drawings, his doodles in the margins of his books. Uh, there's a close-up on that. Uh, at this time, he becomes obsessed with the idea of empire. And he essentially becomes involved in the private sector, because he's still looking for money, so he becomes involved essentially in in you know, uh, uh, navigation startups, right? Uh, where all these private companies like uh, Muscovy Company are starting up to see who can colonize the new world, or, or really who can at least not colonize, but who can get uh, uh, money from the new world, who can go find gold, things like that. So he um, uh, becomes involved in the Muscovy Company, and he becomes obsessed with navigating the Northwest Passage, which is way up there, here, through this tiny, the bearings, the bearings right there around half the world, into Nova Scotia. He gets involved with Muscovy Company, and they send an excavate, indeed send an expedition uh, with um, Adrian, Adrian Gilbert, um, uh, from, from, from Sir Martin Frobisher, because uh, they, they send an expedition. Uh, they go through there. This is what this looks like, going through there. It was, I mean, this is like the space race, right? This is like that incredibly inhospitable territory. It's never been ventured before. They send these rickety wooden ships through this, you know, essentially this, this uh, uh, complete no man's land, frozen. They come up against these, here's the word, right? Wait for it, cyclopean uh, cliffs. Um, and you can imagine being a 16th century Englishman and being on a boat and then coming up and seeing this. They come across, they land, the natives attack them. They are. Uh, they find a gigantic thing of black uh, tar. Uh, they chip it. They find something shiny in it. They say it must be full of gold. They put it on the ship. They bring it back. They dig into it. They pull some gold out, and they and they say, oh "My God, there's infinite gold there again. Infinite money, right?" And uh, then they uh, then they cook the whole thing down, and there's nothing in it. So plan plan failed. He next uh, contracts with Professor Francis Drake, who's a privateer, aka a pirate, aka again, plausible deniability, because he's not a government agent. They, he can, if he gets caught, they can say they have no idea who he is. They send Drake to circumnavigate the tip of South America. So he comes down here, secret mission, no one is told, he comes down around here, up there, parks at San Francisco. Drake's, has anyone been to Drake's Beach? Yes. Okay, so he lands at Drake's Beach. Here's Drake's Beach. Here we go. Okay, so uh, uh, he lands here and he, he calls it Nova Albion, New England. The title was later recycled when the English decided they would rather not to call than San Francisco to call names there. Uh, uh, so uh, now, D is promised, he, he draws up a contract where he says, anything you, if you go north of the 50th parallel, which is right by here. Uh, if you go north of 50th parallel, anything you get is mine, which means, but, but uh, Drake stopped at Oregon, stopped in Oregon. But if you've gone further, uh, Canada would belong to John D. So we can go to so D. D. India uh, over the weekend. He writes a book next called General and Rare Memorials Pertaining to the Perfect Art of Navigation. And. <laughs> See here, you should, it's a little blurry, but you should be able to see here. We've got uh, Shelley. Elizabeth is here. We have the Archangel Michael is guiding her across to the New World. Uh, where here they're setting up. Here's another close up of the New World part. D, after all these experiments, says, You know what? There really should be angels have given me this really please starting to get into the call now. He says, Angel Michael has given me a very interesting idea that there should be this thing called a British Empire. He's the first person to coin the phrase. 
And so the, uh, that's what happens. The, uh, the angels, uh, uh, he, he, uh, he comes up with this phrase. He writes this book, The General of Rare Memorials, and says, there should be an English empire. We should lay claim to <coughs> North America instead of the Catholic bloc, essentially. And uh, that should be our empire, and that's how we're going to get <coughs> infinite money, because England is broke. Uh, and they laugh him out of court, unfortunately. Uh, uh, Sir William Cecil, who was the Secretary of State, says, uh, no, you are a crazy old wizard man. Go. <laughs> <laughs> insane. Go away. Uh, but they um, <coughs> take his proposal. They pay him for it by giving him a leg of lamb. <laughs> <laughs> Such is the payment for the greatest, again, the greatest empire in world history. <coughs> and, um, and so he, uh, they laugh him, they laugh him away, but they later take his idea. Of course. Well, now, he goes back to Mortlake, which is, here is a panoramic shot. Here's what I took this at Mortlake. Here's a panoramic shot. This is a uh, couple months ago. This is the River Thames. And his house was here. <clears throat> and uh, at this time, he uh, is introduced to a man named Edward Kelly. Uh, Edward, so Dee uh, has been auditioning scryers uh, for about a couple years now because he's been getting more interested in the idea of the occult. He is the traditional hardhead, and he knows all the correspondences, he knows all the magic, he knows all the wars, he can recite this off the top of his head, but he can't see anything, he's not psychic, he's not empathetic, he can't sense subtle forces, and he certainly can't scry. So he's been uh, essentially hiring wandering itinerant psychics and auditioning them to uh, varying degrees of success, maybe not a whole lot. Uh, and so this guy shows up, Edward Kelly. Here's an engraving of him, and I'm holding Tritemius, as you can see. And by the way, if you ever tried to engrave anything, you can see how freaking long this would take. <laughs> uh, all right, so with Kelly, over the next uh, several, uh, over the next several, uh, uh, about five to six years, he begins to talk to angels. And he start, he will do the, now again, here's the part where we leave aside all the ceremonial magic, all the golden dawn and the stuff. Uh, leave that to the side, because essentially they're following a religious methodology. He will simply pray and humble himself. It's kind of like if you've read uh, Abramelin or some of the early Grimoires, where there's none of this theory. It's just like, you know, humble yourself, because the idea, again, the great chain of being, magic comes from God. So if you want to, magic means God's way in the world, God's, how God operates. <coughs> so if you want to understand how God operates, you know, humble yourself, get down on your knees. And so that's what he does. Dee will pray and have praise to God for wisdom and to send his angels. And then Kelly will begin scrying. Right? <clears throat> so uh, so they, that's, they, they begin following this methodology. And it works almost immediately when Kelly shows up right? in a way that it hasn't worked before. And Kelly starts channeling these incredible, complex, geometrical designs. And the angels are telling them, uh, uh, you know, the angels are telling them, you're. You're surrounded by demons, you're surrounded by evil, and the demons will show up and give them messages, and then the angels will come and say, no, that was a demon pretending to be an angel, uh, start over. And so they have a lot of problems at the beginning of getting it, uh, and getting it going, getting a clear channel. Um, one of the reasons for that is they have to be <coughs> uh, tuned up, essentially. It's something Lon Duquette talks a lot about in his book, Anokian Vision Magic, which, by the way, if you're interested in getting into this in a practical sense, that's the book to get. It's the least confusing. Um, uh, so they, they, they go through a process where they're essentially being tuned up, and the angels are transmitting this stuff to them that is essentially ritual tools um, that represent the various aspects of the universe. Um, and, uh, but they have a lot of problems. At first, the angels do not like Kelly. They say, this guy is a sorcerer, he is a, you know, uh, and obviously he comes with a negative uh, reputation, or he's a, a forger, he's had his ears cut off for forging coins. Um, he's a charlatan, he has uh, ripped people off, and uh, what's worse for the angels, he's messed with essentially goetic magic. They smell the stench on him a mile, a mile away, and they're like, no, 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 get this guy away, he has trapped with demons, we want nothing to do with that. So, uh, a lot of the sessions are the angel beating the crap out of Dee and Kelly. Yeah. If you read these, if you read the, um, 
manuscripts, um, you essentially, so the manuscripts are split into two books. There's one called The Five Books of Mystery, Johnny's Five Books of Mystery, and there's one called, um, uh, which was published as A True and Faithful Relation by America Selden. It's now published and redone by Stephen Skinner as um, John B's Spiritual Diaries. That's the one to get. A lot of those books are them kicking the crap out of these guys. Now you have to, now you, okay, now you have to think. We've got D, who is, by all intents and purposes, the most intelligent person in Europe, right? He's got, he's more educated, or at least in England, he's, he's got, he's more educated than anyone in England. He's got the biggest library. He has a library of 2,500 books at a time that Oxford and Cambridge have about 400 each, right? <clears throat> and uh, he is, you know, he knows everything, right? And the angels, he is a, a lumbering monkey to the angels. Okay, he, you know, they look at the angels, the view of the angels towards humanity is not comforting, right? The angels, uh, uh, they, they, they view human beings as fallen and sinful creatures who are constantly bumbling around and bumping into things and getting in the way of the plan and, you know, refusing to carry through uh, God's plan. And they keep telling them, this is what we want you to do. And Dee and Kelly are lazy, they sleep in, they don't go to sessions. They, you know, at one point, um, they keep asking for money, the angels uh, keep saying, you know, we, you've worked for decades to talk to angels and God, and we're giving you the wisdom of the universe, and you're asking us for money? Like, literally, what is wrong with you? <laughs> uh, they proceed to this, that Kelly next asked to borrow money from the angels. <laughs> You can imagine the frustration that must be increasing. You can see their frustration increasing as time goes on. So, um, yeah. So, uh, uh, but they're being humble. They're being sanctified. They're being Christian. Right? They're being, you know, they're being ground down. And that's essentially what Enochian magic does, right? If you want to know a sense of what Enochian is, it is a system for grinding you into oblivion, right? Has anyone done an opening here, or that wants to raise your hand? Okay, so you, you, may know, you probably know what I'm talking about. Yep. Right? Uh, Anokian is not about getting what you want. It is not about, you know, getting shiny stuff, or, you know, being glamorous, or whatever, you know, whatever people want from paganism or, or magic. It is none of that. Anokian is about destroying, and not even in a, a new age way of, you know, turn off your ego, man. Like, it's literally uh, grinding you into submission. That's what Enochian is, so that uh, the light of God can shine through. And that's what the angels, I'm gonna speed up a bit, but the world, what the angels basically say is, you're fallen, mankind is fallen. You, you were in the Garden of Eden, and in the Garden of Eden, Adam could speak with the angels, and spoke with the tongue of angels, which we now know as Enochian. <clears throat> And everything was perfect until you fucked it up and you ate from the tree of the knowledge of good, uh, good and evil. And then mankind fell and was cast out east of Eden. So here we have Eden. Uh, here is Adam and Eve being cast out into the wilderness. Uh, they begin to lose the tongue of angels. And instead of an Okean, they now begin speaking Hebrew, which is uh, essentially, a, according to the angels, is a uh, and not modern Hebrew, but ancient Hebrew, which is kind of like a, sort of, you know, a bad carbon copy of, of Angelic. Okay, I'm going to speed up. So, uh, here is uh, the scrying crystal they were using. By the way, if you've ever seen the, uh, the if you've ever seen the uh, famous images of the scrying, the scrying mirror, black scrying mirror, you've, you've probably seen these online. The black scrying mirror and the sigil of and all this that's in the British Museum, that's not these equipment. That was later from Lion Tate Scribes. This is the actual crystal they used. It was manifested at the era by the Archangel Uriel. But that's the piece. This one is the actual one. So I wanted to get to it. It does a good take on this as well. This is the Sigil of Day, which I'm sure you've seen. Uh, this is the uh, architecture of reality, the seven planets. Or this architecture of the, the reality is manifested by the seven planets. Here is the Enochian language. Uh, which they give them, of course, they, give, they essentially give them all the primordial knowledge once they're ground down enough. The, uh, this is the uh, diagram of the Lodge Towers. And they say, and now that we've told you all of this, we want you to go to Prague, go to the Emperor, Holy Roman Emperor Rudolph II, 
tell him he is possessed by demons and that he needs to immediately stop what he's doing and do exactly what we tell him. Because according to the ancient I'll say it. so again, the angels are not fond of humanity. Their word for humanity is whores. They see and they see humanity as a horse. That's what they call humanity. Why? Not in the sexual sense, but in the sense that human beings will focus on literally anything except for God. Right? The, the attention is poured to Pokemon Go. I don't know. <laughs> uh, and they, they are not pleased, and they are not pleased with the Reformation. Uh, they, and they say, uh, Luther and Calvin have their reward, meaning they are now in eternal torment. They are also not pleased with the Catholic Church. They say that uh, the Catholic Church has fallen, and uh, you need to reconcile yourself to it, but the moral institution has fallen. They say the Holy Roman Empire has fallen, and... Uh, go and tell uh, Rudolph to get down on his knees and do what we say. They do this. <laughs> he again says, um, that's quite nice. Can you give me infinite money? Can you do that? <laughs> and uh, they say, no, but we can give you all the secrets of the universe. And he says, thank you, leave. Um, however, he later contracts Edward Kelly. Uh, he basically, Kelly throws D under the bus and goes off to do alchemy for Rudolph leaving his mentor behind after taking all of his secrets, um, but he gets his just dues when um, he attempts to escape Rudolph's palace and then jumps out a window and breaks his legs and dies, which is shortly thereafter, which is the official story, although not a definite story. Um, so also the Catholic Church becomes aware of their activities at this time. The Jesuits try to kill them um, because they are not fond of this idea that uh, any people can talk to angels without being an intermediary of the church. Um, so, he returns. Uh, he, okay, this is, he's put out to pasture as an academic in Manchester and spends his last days essentially in, uh, uh, essentially being put out to pasture by the incoming regime. Elizabeth is now dying. He has no support that James I, who's a Puritan, it's basically like the, the Republican fundamentalist takeover of the government, like in the 80s. You know, Elizabeth's time period is much more tolerant. The Puritans come in. This is where John B. is buried. He's buried under the ground. This is a church in Mortlake. That is the plate where he is buried. That is uh, his family seal, the red dots. Uh, he, yes, so he, he died shortly thereafter after his. Most of his children are taken by the plague, very sadly, and his wife, and he essentially loses everything. Uh, but at the same time, they just like Crowley, they have over-dramatized that. Um, he, he probably rose to as high of a position as he could, given his rank and education. This is the stained glass where he is buried. Now, this is only half of my book. The rest is what happens after. Um, we unfortunately are getting close to the end, so I would love to I continue to talk about this. I could talk about this for a week without stopping. It is that complex, but unfortunately we're running out of time. So, um, uh, the, the implications of this are massive. Uh, obviously, the British Empire um, is, is, you know, we are, we are here by dint of Dee's plan and many other aspects of the modern world in direct correlation of his work. Um, but we are unfortunately coming to the end of our time, so I'm, I'm going to save this, this uh, last five minutes for questions. Yes? I feel like I read somewhere that um, the angels got into some business with like wife swapping between the two. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. I'm sorry, how can I leave out yeah. wife swapping? That's the longest part. Okay, so um, when they return, they're, when they're in the continent, the angels basically say, and by the way, this is, um, uh, so there's an angel named Medini, who's one of, from the Sigil. Basically says, um, you were to share all things in common. Okay, and here's the thing, right? Now, obviously, everyone's going to be Kelly being a charlatan. This is kind of the reason why, one of the main reasons why. Kelly says, um, excuse me, uh, um, I don't need to be in truth, but the angels have told me that uh, I need to sleep with your wife. And he said, it's God's will, and, and you have to do it. Uh, and D says, what are you talking about? Uh, D calls up the angels and they say, yes, it's true. <laughs> Kelly says, I don't want to do this. I really don't. This wasn't my idea. Uh, but, uh, 
He also right. hates his being able to tell him being married, and he doesn't want to get married. Uh, and he hates his wife, but he likes Steve's wife. Um, <laughs> so Kelly, Kelly says, I've been in a fit of tears and praying to God for this will damn my eternal soul, but they're kind of saying we should. Uh, and, uh, and they do, and things get awkward afterwards. <laughs> but shortly after they do, uh, the spirit that is later recognized as Babylon by Alistair Crowley appears and says, now you are free. You are, you are free of sexual um, hang-ups, essentially. But, but that's not how they took it. They were obviously very deeply disturbed by it. And it, kind of, it ended their working relationship. Uh, and that's the end of the Spirit Diaries. That's the end of their, uh, that's the end of their collaboration. Um, obviously, this would become of much interest to him uh, when he began to own a new team work. Yes? Just very quickly, how old were they when they met? Uh, that's a great question. So Kelly, uh, excuse me, um, D was in his early 50s, and Kelly was like 25. He so was half of his age. Of Kelly? Hmm. What do you think that was? Um, I'm, that's a, I'm not sure exactly. I believe it, is, uh, it could have been later in life yeah. because he also wrote some interesting alchemical documents for Rudolph. Yeah. Um, or it could have been at the time, you know, or it could have been done not from life. It could have been right. somebody's conception of what he looked like. Uh, the descriptions that we have of Kelly are that he was um, an alcoholic, overweight, uh, had his ears cut off. Um, and was very, um, he's constantly essentially having psychotic breaks during the sessions, and he keeps telling D, these are demons, we need to stop talking to these beings because they're telling me all the stuff that goes against uh, scripture, and uh, D essentially is pushing him, and, and so many people have read this as, this has been read in a couple ways, one is that Kelly, um, or, uh, so, so the obvious first way this was read was that Kelly was, lying to D, that he was making this up because he was getting paid, he was on salary, he had every reason in the world to keep D going. Um, uh, another reading is that D is the, the victimizer in that relationship, essentially. He's a slave driver with Kelly and is constantly forcing him to work and, you know, he's getting essentially psychic burnout, agnostic burnout, from constantly talking to these beings and he's constantly having meltdowns and he'll flee and run out of Orlake and come back. And, uh, you know, this goes on their entire working relationship. There's lots of ways that you can read the relationship. You can read it as he was mentally ill. You can read it as if there were drugs involved or alcohol. You can read it as uh, a, a combination of all of this. Or you can read it as it was literally true. Um, but uh, obviously, these are the mysteries of history. Yes? So, um, when they were working, was it um, Kelly who was sort of speaking to and then you mentioned that the angels were saying that Kelly was a, you know, a bad person, so was that coming through Kelly himself? Yeah, it was coming through Kelly, uh, because basically Kelly was saying, he was looking at the scrying ball and saying what he was seeing and what he was hearing, and he was writing it down. Uh, so yes, it was, it was coming through Kelly, uh, surprisingly, right? Um, uh, they weren't really fond of D. They, they didn't really like D that much either, um, mostly because they just thought he was um, arrogant, right? And and uh, but they they didn't, they didn't have moral problems with him. D was a very devout individual, or right? well, they had serious moral problems with Kelly. But mainly, they just get really angry that they keep telling them what to do and then they won't do it. <laughs> so uh, they're kind. Of, it's kind of like a like a. Like an irritated parent relationship, or like literally, the angels basically see them as animals. They're like, you know, you're like a dog that's disobeying. You know, what, what's wrong with you? You have to be disciplined. You know, so, yeah, I hope that answers your question. It's been the, the kind of critique or analysis of a language purely like on a linguistic level. Okay. So there's a linguist named Donald Laycock in the 70s who wrote a book called The Complete American Dictionary who previously studied, I think, uh, Urdu or Swahili or something like he'd studied African languages. And uh, he, um, he looked at, okay, I may get this wrong, so please double check this, but uh, uh, Crowley says it is a, Crowley says it's a full language with its own syntax and, and grammar and all of that. Laycock looks at it and he says, it's a real language, but it is kind of missing a few components. But um, uh, Crowley's view of it was, you know, Crowley has a famous line in The Vision and the Voice where it's like, look, if Kelly was making this up, like he was a trained, he was also making up stuff as a trained ling uh, linguist with a command of the, the English language other than Shakespeare, the Bible, and Milton. 
you know, the passages in the end. And by the way, if you want to study the stuff, you have to read the original diaries because, you know, the language of those things is, you know, it is sublime. Right? You don't get that from, like, getting a or something or like a modern book on it. You have to read the original material because you don't get a sense of the sonorousness of that, of the angels and the, the, you know, the beauty of, like, some of the stuff that comes, you know, they're saying, even like, uh, and Crowley talks about this too, I mean, even the translation of some of the calls where they're saying, like, you know, like, the, can the wings of the winds, uh, I don't know if get it wrong, but, uh, 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 yeah, so basically Crowley is saying, like, you know, look, if this guy was making it up, he made up something that is, like, of more importance mathematically, linguistically, and as a piece of literature, and essentially anything else from this time period, right? So, um, but uh, that's, that's the most I can answer your question, I think. Yes? Well, I, um, when he taught ge um, Euclid's geometry in Paris, that upset the real estate developers there. Mm -hmm. Did what's that, uh, what's up? It, it, what, I, I, I that. think I was from French, from this book. Uh, I'll have to go back and look. Yeah, and so I was wondering, did his later persecutions coming from spilling the beans on how realtors uh, develop property because they measured everything by perimeter, and if you keep dividing the square smaller, you get bigger perimeters and thus charging more money for less property. Huh. I will have to go back and look at the, at the French. I don't know about that. That's, that's fascinating. I will look. Uh, more questions? Okay. I, I, I would love to keep talking, but we're, we, we're at time. So, thank you very much.